Welcome and thanks for joining us today. I'm Paul Fegley. I'm a director of technology at AT&T. And joining me today are two members of my team, uh, Mike O'Connor, a senior systems engineer, and Tony Morell, a uh, principal uh, systems engineer. Today we're going to be talking about uh, our experience with hardware certification. And both Tony and Mike have extensive certification in certifying solutions for public and private clouds. We've been a period of remarkable transformation within the uh, telecommunication space. Network demand is skyrocketing. We're up to 137 petabytes of data a day crossing our network. Video traffic has grown substantially. It grew 75% last year, driven by smartphones. And when you think about it, the smartphone that we all carry really was invented only about 10 years ago. Apple introduced the first iPhone in June 10 years ago. But since that point, AT&T mobile data traffic is up 250,000% since 2007. And the trend continues. So it's network demand skyrocketing. Fantastic times for carriers. Oh, wait a second. Prices are dropping. They're dropping like a rock. Very uh, transformational times for carriers because to meet the falling industry prices, we can't continue to do things the way we used to. With all the demand that's occurring, we cannot afford to keep on buying uh, the exact same hardware and doing things the same way. So AT&T is making a very major effort to pivot from proprietary solutions to open source solutions uh, using OpenStack uh, and AT&T Integrated Cloud is one of our key initiatives. Network functional virtualization is another key initiative because we really have to go from purpose-built equipment to open source white box commodity products. As we work through this process, we, at and is still making remarkable investments. We're investing over $22 billion in capital investments a year. So it's not like we're not investing, but to meet the soaring demands, to meet the dropping prices, we have to do things radically different. I'd just like to give you two simple examples of how much prices have dropped. I remember it used to be uh, calling long distance across the country. You could easily pay a dollar a minute to place a phone call. Now everyone with their phone plans, it's virtually free to place long distance anywhere in the US. Just a year ago, many carriers charged $15 a gigabyte if you exceeded your data limits. Now with AT&T on a family plan with four phones for only $40 a phone, you can get 22 gig of data without any throttling. If you go over that, you just get throttled. So that's just an indication of how dramatically the prices have been dropping and why a radical transformation is required. So it's exciting times for consumers and all the new services, all the needs for data that's coming out. It's also a transformational time for the carriers because you can't continue to do what we used to do. I'd like to describe a little bit about what we're moving to OpenStack in the virtualized environment. In central offices where we had our dedicated hardware and uh, network equipment, that was specialized, we're moving those to virtualized network functions on AIC. In the data center space, where we had large complexes of VMware or other proprietary virtualization centers, uh, solutions, we're also moving those to AIC. And it's a very strategic focus within AT&T. And from what I described in the first slide, you can understand why, because our whole business is transforming. We really need to get these enterprise and central office workloads to the cloud and leverage software-defined networking uh, to be successful and continue to thrive as a company. at and had very aggressive network virtualization goals. In 2015, we had a goal of 5%, and we actually achieved 5.7%. Last year, we had a goal of 30%, and we uh, virtualized 34%. So you can see we're going through a real tipping of the traffic. This year, our goal is 55%, we're on the range to 75. The reason why we're going for 75 is we're not expecting 100% of the traffic to be virtualized. We're expecting some of that traffic, legacy traffic will be retired in place. So we're not trying to move 100% of our traffic to uh, the cloud, but we have a very strategic focus for very compelling business needs that we can't keep up with the demand and keep on buying that equipment uh, and stay in business.
Based upon our planned workloads, uh, AT&T has a very unique cloud configuration. We're one of the largest OpenStack deployments in the world. Domestically, we have more than 74 zones, and globally, we have more than eight zones. And this year, we're more than doubling the amount of compute nodes in those various locations. Uh, we're looking for a very dynamic, flexible workload because we're not bright enough to know what the next hot thing is going to be. So one of the key things we need is a virtualized infrastructure that can be quickly reconfigured so we can leverage what we have to meet rapidly evolving consumer demands. Uh, we believe very much that you cannot reconfigure things fast enough manually, and that's the reason why we have contributed our ecomp uh, platform to ONAP. Uh, so there's a com command and control structure with ONAP that you can do rapid deployments and rapid reconfigurations of the underlying uh, network uh, infrastructure. Our workloads vary dramatically. We have many small locations uh, that are in central offices for workloads that require very low latency. When you think about placing a phone call, you don't like a long time delays uh, going back and forth in the middle of your communication. But if you're watching a video, you don't really know whether it's a five second buffer or not uh, as it's downloading it. So for streaming, where you're not sensitive to the latency between two people talking interactively, that can go very well in our larger uh, locations where you can scale up and scale down very effectively. Uh, one of our key goals is to try to run any workload in any ASC location. And for many people in the audience, you might think, well, that's a relatively simple goal. But we're a telecommunications company focused on security. So we have a lot of VLANs, we have a lot of firewalls, and we have a lot of other configurations that when we move workloads around, there's a lot of network changes that need to be done. We do not run AIC on a flat infrastructure where any node can talk to any node. Uh, but we follow best-in-class security, which means the workloads are very isolated. So moving workloads around and reconfiguring the networks and the firewalls is a non-trivial problem. As we went through this hardware experience, we found that OpenStack hardware requires integration. We had some leaders who said, do you know, open source is an open stack is very widely used in the industry. You can just put these things together and use them. And we tried that, and it didn't quite work to our expectations. I guess we shouldn't have been surprised, because even when we were buying proprietary solutions and we tried it, we always found we needed to certify and uh, test and validate that it really met our uh, business needs. So this is not something new, it, but it was just reinforcing, despite all the changes, we still needed to uh, do integration on our hardware. We have some unique workloads. We're putting the core of our business on uh, OpenStack. So from that standpoint, we may have higher expectations for reliability. We may have higher expectations for failover than other people in the industry. So what we're describing is what we found necessary to do our workload. If you're doing a standard IT workload and there's no real impact if you're down for a few hours, you may find that you can skip our steps but we found for providing high reliability solutions to AT&T consumers, we needed to certify and validate the hardware configurations. We also found we had a very wide performance in uh, response times between different pieces of hardware. An extreme example was volume creation for one vendor using spinning disk took about 100 to 120 seconds. If you're dealing with IT workloads, we only create the volumes once a month or once a year. Who cares? But within our planned usage configuration, where we were expecting that we would be routinely reconfiguring workloads, redeploying them between locations, and we said, you know, for some of our scenarios, it wasn't one volume that needed to be created. It might be 20 or 30. Under those circumstances, the view was that time was totally unacceptable, and a different vendor was chosen with using flash arrays uh, versus spinning disks. So we were also changing technologies around, and we had a very radical difference in performance. What I'm really trying to emphasize is know what business need you're trying to solve, because your business need will determine whether the hardware 
configurations and whether response times really meet your needs. And all the hardware that we were using really did work with OpenStack. It just it did not meet our needs. It may have met IT workload needs. It may have met student computing needs, but it did not meet the expectations for very rapid configurations for AIC. Next up is Tony Morello, and he's going to be talking about how our learnings were applied and some of our certifications experiences. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, so address some of the, to address some of the areas of concern uh, that Paul referred to earlier, what we did is we created a team that we kind of referred to as the AIC Hardware Integration Team. And the goal of this team was to allow us to keep up with the constantly changing hardware that we introduced into AIC. So this team is responsible for validating the new hardware identified for AIC and ensuring that the interoperability of the hardware with the target version of OpenStack all works seamlessly. Each OpenStack environment is unique and has its own characteristics. So ensuring that there is this compatibility between the hardware and software is critical. And if you think that you don't need certification testing because you're dealing with the top shelf vendors, um, think again. Because what we found, as Paul mentioned earlier, is that even with top shelf vendors who say they've certified with OpenStack, you still need to go in there and test your own use cases. So testing uh, software and hardware is not a new concept. And um, historically, we have tested um, hardware and software in, in many different scenarios. Um, and we've leveraged on these learnings from this testing uh, for this new team. I mean, we've tested hardware and software with um, VMware. We've tested base operating systems such as Windows and Linux on new hardware. And we tested many, many, many software and hardware configurations as we dealt with hosted customers, both internal and external. So new hardware means new drivers. And that's true, obviously, of across vendors and it's even different versions from the same vendor. Uh, so basically, uh, the takeaway is that any piece of hardware that you put out in your environment, you need to test. So in our case, AT&T is, is a very large company, as you know, and there's many, many policies and procedures that have to be adhered to before a piece of hardware can you know, go, go from the uh, identification stage to getting out into production. And this translates to a very, very long cycle time. I mean, even just getting the required approvals takes significant time. So the idea behind this team was simple. And that was we wanted to shorten the cycle time from when the hardware was identified to when we can get that hardware implemented in production. And you want to get the hardware into production as soon as possible to take advantage of all the improvements that come out with each iteration of the hardware. I mean, each iteration offers enhancements in performance, functionality, scalability, and all these things, they translate uh, to increased workloads, savings in power consumption and operating costs, and increased manageability. So the key output from our team was to trigger placement of the order early in the cycle. And when the order was placed in parallel, we can hand the hardware off to the subsequent development teams who could do their testing, and they could do the uh, automation to help us deploy this new hardware into production. So note that there's additional outputs that come out of this team as well. Um, we also provide uh, configuration and installation uh, information, um, component information that could be referred to by developers and management. And we also provide some high-level uh, performance testing so we could see how vendor A performs uh, as compared to vendor B. So useful stuff. So when a new piece of hardware is identified, uh, we have a team of engineers at the enterprise level who do an excellent job of, of testing that with a base operating system, for example, um, you know, Linux. And what we do is we take that handoff from our enterprise team and now we add the OpenStack layer on top of that. 
So our main focus here is to introduce a new piece of server hardware as a compute node and then validate the storage arrays that will ultimately connect to those compute nodes. These compute nodes are in the form of 1U and 2U servers, from, again, from top shelf vendors. We also concentrate on network adapters as we move from 10 gig to 25 gig to 40 gig and beyond. And that allows us to better take advantage of the high performance virtual network functions that we have in our environment. When it comes to storage arrays, we look at arrays that use both legacy hard disk technology and newer flash technology. So one thing that we hear quite often is, when can we swap in top shelf vendor hardware as generic white box? And I mean, we found that a compute is close, but we see that the hardware from different vendors will, never, will inevitably be different and unique. Certainly there are BIOS settings and firmware that need to be accounted for, but even beyond that, there are plenty of deltas that need to be um, taken in, into account. For example, on vendor A's hardware, our Pixie boot process might need to Pixie boot off of embedded NIC1, whereas if we're using um, vendor B, it might be using embedded NIC3. Now certainly these are things that could be handled in the software, but the point is that unless you identify these uh, differences, your deployment scripts can fail. So again, the key point here is that all hardware really needs to be um, tested. So it's impossible for vendors to test every scenario that their hardware will, will be used in. So it's really up to you to test your specific use cases on that hardware. For, and I'll give you an example of what we ran into. Um, we ordered some storage arrays, and the storage arrays were to come with um, hard drives with a um, six gigabyte transfer rate. Well, sometime when placing the order and the order shipping, those drives uh, were no longer available. So the vendor swapped in drives with a 12 gig transfer rate. So everybody said, great, we're gonna get you know, faster, better performing drives. But guess what happened? When we got these uh, storage units into production, uh, everything failed. Turned out that our Linux kernel was, was a little bit older and it didn't support the newer technology in the drives. So we ended up with a bunch of storage arrays that we had to find new homes for. The complexity of your environment can also be tied to the performance, which can differ from vendor benchmarks, which are most likely uh, sunny day scenarios. And not only can your numbers, uh, performance numbers be different, but they can be significantly lower. And this doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem, but by incorporating the overhead of your application, you can get a better idea of what the performance will be that you'll see in production. Another thing that we noticed is that sometimes the installation and configuration steps provided by the vendor may not be for your specific implementation. We have seen scenarios where, for example, MPIO and iSCSI instructions were written for a generic Linux implementation and not our specific implementation. And these uh, deviations all take time to troubleshoot. So again, each environment is unique and, and you have to understand that and treat it that way. So we still find that many folks think that you could just grab a piece of hardware, plug it in, and it's gonna work. So then the question is, well, what is there to test? Well, in the past, as I said before, we focused on the base OS on bare metal and we tested that all the core functionality existed and performed as expected. This included uh, creating NIC bonds, testing NIC failover, et cetera. But now by putting OpenStack on there, you've added another layer of complexity. So now we still do the same tests, but now we do it with OpenStack installed. So now we generate heat stacks and we pull the cables to test high availability. And we try to leverage whatever open source tools that are available first. But if we can't find a tool that fits our needs, we'll develop it in-house so it'll meet our specific use case. And this allows us greater flexibility to target specific areas and to enhance the scripts as we find new and better ways to test. And this includes scripts that we've created to test the common OpenStack API endpoints, 
as well as other scripts that we could spin up heat stacks and we could kind of do a high level performance test. Just, just note that our testing is not really to determine um, maximums, but really just to kind of see what kind of performance we could expect to see in a, in a certain period of time. And to talk about these scripts in more detail, I'm going to introduce Mike O'Connor. Thanks, Tony. So you, you may have your IT manager or your CTO come out to you and say, hey, what's this OpenStack all about? We need to start certifying this new application on your OpenStack instance. So for a conventional hardware team, it might be a little intimidating at first trying to understand what Nova is, where your Cinder volume service is, and all these new services that are going to be introduced into your OpenStack environment. And you might not have a lot of experience with an OpenStack deployment. So for us, we, we uh, started out with uh, setting up some DevStack environments. We followed the OpenStack uh, instructions on the website to go through and really get an understanding of how OpenStack works, how the APIs talk to each other, where the log files are, and make sure you turn on debug mode to see the tracebacks, see what's going on, to really have an understanding of what's going on behind the scenes and not just from you know, the Horizon UI or the CLI. So it's very important to understand that um, you might not even be able to rely on uh, your vendors all the time for, for support because you might have a scenario in the past where you just call up you know, a vendor, uh, VMware, and say, hey, I've got this issue. Can we get a patch or a new uh, executable to fix this issue? You get a new patch and apply it in a couple weeks, whatever, and you're up and, up and running. So I think from the hardware point of view, certification teams need to think about getting involved and going out to GitHub, looking at the driver files, see what's actually changing under the covers, what, change, what changes are occurring, what feature sets are being implemented in a particular Cinder driver or, or your Nova um, libvirt stuff. So I think that really requires a, a mindset change for, for a, a hardware certification team. Um, on the screen here now, you can see that um, these are some of the high level uh, testing items that we, we complete. Um, you know, we were able to leverage a lot of the knowledge that we have used in the past for our certifications, but I actually help, it helped out a lot being able to introduce the heat, as uh, Tony mentioned, and using the heat stacks um, for, for stressing our environment to make sure everything's working properly. Um, we also validate a lot of the, the, the cables you know, to make sure if we spin up a heat stack and we can make sure it's running and, and see volumes created, instances created, and therefore we will go and, and pull cables on the storage array and we'll see, hey, does that heat stack keep going? Or are REST calls still be mating to the storage API to see that those volumes are still being created, being um, attached, and also the, the iSCSI traffic's traversing the appropriate network. Um, and when we pull those cables, we want to make sure that that fails over properly. And if it doesn't, obviously we have either an issue with the Cinder driver, and we usually work with our vendors to try to resolve these issues. So we needed a way to, to um, test, test a lot of our hardware with some new tools, because not everybody on our team was developers or, or had in-depth scripting knowledge. So we came up with a way to, we wrote some Python scripts that are leveraged with uh, YAML configuration files that actually drive our test cases against our hardware. Um, then the output's put in a, a CSV file, and then we can make comparisons. But we're just trying to see times with how long it takes to create an instance and how long it takes to attach a volume or you know, something like a, a live migration or uh, you know, uh, post aggregates uh, and anything from Cinder retypes to unmanaged, managed stuff. But the point is we're able to do this effectively and efficiently because we were using this, these YAML files that anybody can go in there, it's easy to read um, and, and modify uh, quickly. Um, when we did start, start out first, uh, you know, we had to do an inventory of the, the OpenStack APIs on, on dev.openstack.org uh, to get an understanding uh, and a, a full list of all the APIs that we'll be testing. Um, but the, the thing we, we want to take um, account for is the fact that the, uh, so the, uh, the command line interface will vary a lot of times from what's actually on the documentation we found. So we would always turn on the debug command. When you're making your CLI call, you can see the at actual uh, debug the, the, the curl request that's actually being made as well. So we take that back and we interrogate that response and make sure that we see a pass or a fail during our testing. So again, I would really recommend using that debug feature when you're doing anything from the CLI. Um, and again, you'll see a lot of variances sometimes between 
you know, something that's documented for a cinder driver. We've seen differences with manages and, and retypes or, um, you know, anything that's actually listed on the, the docs that, uh, or the dev.openstack.org uh, website. So next slide here, it's important to understand and, and set your test cases for what you're trying to achieve with your environment. For our lab, we were trying to achieve a, a, a heat stack that would execute for a 60 minute time frame. We want to see how many instances we can create in various flavor sizes and how many volumes we can actually attach to that particular instance during that 60 minute time frame. When we first started out, we quickly identified a, a lot of restrictions I shouldn't say restrictions, but just lower default values within OpenStack that uh, we had to modify for our use case to be able to achieve the 60 minute time frame. This includes anything from the, the nova.com file, the, the cinder.com file, uh, the RPC response timeouts, um, a lot of the, the um, HTTP retries, and anything from the, the base, base OS, the multipath packages, the iSCSI, and making sure that the blacklists are set appropriately in multipath, you have appropriate timeouts around Robin, whatever type of uh, uh, queuing policies you have defined with your MPIO. So again, it's important to identify that and set those values appropriately to achieve your goal and what you're trying to do with your environment. So we quickly found out you know, we were hitting limits with MySQL connections, so we would have to bump that out for particular storage arrays, or we would have to um, c configure a multipath because we would hit uh, uh, FDS uh, limitations, so we'd have to up that, so how many volumes we can actually physically attach to a, a particular KVM host. So these were the kind of things that we just ran into during our, our testing that we would have to modify to uh, meet our goal of a 60-minute uh, uh, instance uh, heat stack run. So definitely do your homework. Uh, you know, make sure you check if you, you're working with a particular vendor. Make sure you have any vendor or uh, patches that they recommend applied to Nova and Cinder and uh, any iSCSI. Um, you know, whatever type of storage um, you're using to make sure you have the appropriate patches applied. And also go upstream. Go see what's going on. Again, see if there's any patches you should be pulling in or cherry picking or backporting to, to an older version of OpenStack that um, you might be using. And another thing is that we, we did find out sometimes we might get conflicting values. You know, you might have a storage vendor that says, hey, set your response, RPC response timeout to, you know, X. But then you might have a, an OS vendor say, no, no, don't do that, set it to this. So a lot of times we'll see conflicting values. You don't want to leave it open too long because you can run into out of memory um, exceptions because you're, you're having way too many connections open and they're waiting for a response. So the RPC uh, timeout just gets all fumbled up. So again, it's just important to test that environment, define your use cases, and analyze the settings that are in your environment to make sure that you're, you're not uh, running into any issues there. So another thing we did, we, we, we're doing a lot of uh, uh, manual work on our team to go out, spin up a heat stack, go out and install the packages manually, whatever type of packages we're using to uh, validate an environment. And you know, we would do some synthetic, synthetic IOP testing just to be able to understand that the, the, the plumbing in our environment's working properly, that the configuration files are, are working good. Um, so we built an in-house web app that able to, enabled us to do this. So it's going to go out and um, create our heat stack. We build a Node.js REST API that will um, deploy the heat stack, spin up how many instances you like, attach the volumes, then therefore uh, start up your, your storage performance testing, or, or if you had a particular application that you want to test out, that it will go out and install those packages and bring us back that data automatically, and therefore we can start to um, get just an understanding of, of how things are working. Again, we're not using this for, for maximum uh, identification of, of, of the storage array, just because, I mean, there's so many variations with, with the storage testing with, you know, if your array has uh, DD, uh, data deduplication or if there's, um, uh, you know, advanced features on that storage array that you're looking to test, you know, it really takes somebody that, um, storage guy that does that all the time to really get a, a clear understanding of maximum throughput for that environment. So again, we're just trying to make sure that that configuration is working properly and we didn't break anything with that new storage array being introduced. So hopefully you see my charts here. Um, here's an example of uh, some volume attachment times between uh, two storage vendors. Uh, I think it's roughly a 30% difference. 
between the two. But you can see that this is the type of information that we're trying to understand, how, how quickly these storage arrays can attach volumes and also detach. We, you know, another thing is that we want to make sure that that heat stack can be deleted and abandoned properly because we would notice issues where after that heat stack gets created, you know, it might be all good in the Horizon UI, but you go in there and you still might have uh, multi-path or iSCSI connections that are, are still in an orphan state that uh, if you don't clean them up properly, we just ran into issues where we're trying to create a new heat stack and therefore um, just have further issues with our testing. So, you know, it's good to go in there and manually check those settings out as, you know, the, the iSCSI connections as well. Um, and this also kind of helps us to give a, an idea of, uh, if there's a change in you know, uh, firmware and we have to go out and reevaluate a storage array, you know, we can see if, uh, if th there's any variations between that, between the previous runs. We can do comparisons in these attached times. We can see if a, a particular patch that we pulled in for, again, uh, MPIO or ISCSI was an issue and um, identify if, if that's slowing down our attached times. I'm going to hand it off to Tony again here, and uh, he's going to talk about some of our OpenStack instances. Thanks, Mike. So another technique that we found to be quite useful is to test in a vanilla OpenStack environment in addition to testing in our uh, Marantis uh, fuel-deployed OpenStack environment. And we found that this could actually help us identify whether an issue was inherent to Linux, OpenStack, or we introduce that issue in our more complex code. Any of us who's had to troubleshoot um, an issue in a multi-layered environment, uh, such as OpenStack, could admit that it could be quite challenging when doing that troubleshooting. So, uh, for example, we had an issue where we ran the test in our vanilla environment and we ran it in our um, you know, fuel-deployed Marantis environment we noticed that the vanilla environment was significantly outperforming um, the Marantis environment. Now, this issue, we, pr we might not have even have seen this issue, but it was only by able to draw the comparison between the two environments that we were able to isolate that it was an issue with um, HA proxy. And you know, certainly in our environment, you know, with high availability um, being so important, um, you know, it's very important that we found this issue when we made the uh, configuration changes to HA proxy to fix it. So some people might think that this two uh, lab uh, testing technique is, is overkill, but I, I mention it to you so you can keep it in your back pocket because there are going to be scenarios where it might be um, useful to you. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some issues that we've uncovered in our testing. And what we found is that the issues can be unknown issues, they can be issues that are undocumented, or it could be issues that, you know, just have not been and shared with anyone. So, Mike? Yeah, thanks, Tony. So when we're doing our testing, we, we ran into some issues with uh, some of our vendor, with some of the storage arrays we were testing, where we would, uh, again, kind of going back to what I said before, create a heat stack, make sure it's running, go to the array, pull the, the uh, primary NIC ETH0, and see if that, that will fail over properly, if your heat stack's still being created, and uh, the, the fact that we would see volume creation errors and the heat stack would fail, that's obviously a big concern for us. So we would go back, work with the vendor and to, to overcome that, uh, that issue. Another issue we saw, uh, we saw the fact that um, we had issues with a particular storage array that would traverse the same physical network for both data and, and storage. So obviously we're very security minded here at at and and we wanted to make sure that we always have separate, ne uh, separate network excuse me, for, for data in the storage network. So we, we came across this, this issue, and again, we worked with, with the vendor to, to resolve this. But um, this is yeah. why, again, it's just important to test these environments. To yeah, and, it, and that's an interesting one, because even after we did our testing, um, we still uh, found an issue with that, it, because what happened was when they rolled this um, storage array out into production, because the data was management and data traffic were uh, traversing the same uplink, what happened was the MTU size on the switch was still set to the default of 1500 and jumbo frames were never enabled. 
Right, so then it just obviously led to performance application issues, uh, performance issues with the application, uh, and just caused more, caused more headaches for uh, right. our operation folks. Right, now in a typical scenario, that issue probably never would have happened because everybody, you know, the team would have been aware downstream that the data jumbo frames had to be enabled on, on the switch uh, that the data was going through. That's right. Um, I guess the takeaway from that is, you, you, again, I keep repeating it over and over again, you really need to test everything. Uh, you know, this might be uh, straightforward for a lot of folks, but uh, definitely when you, you're starting out, go to your OpenStack uh, um, support matrix for Cinder. Go see what a particular Cinder driver is supported in a feature, or the support matrix for, for Cinder, and see what actual features are enabled for that, that Cinder driver, and in the particular release of OpenStack that you're running with. Uh, you know, the feature sets definitely vary uh, between instances of OpenStack, so uh, if you're paying for a certain feature on an array, you want to make sure your OpenStack instance can, can uh, uh, accommodate that. So go out there and check that Cinder support matrix out and alongside with the, the Ubuntu uh, Canonical website for the hardware certification validation work that they do to see if your particular kernel and, and um, operating system versions supported with uh, um, your hardware that you're trying to run with there. Right, and again, we, we've seen uh, you know, issues that if you're running a little bit older version of the software and you bring in a new piece of hardware, there's, there's a good chance that that new hardware just will not be supported properly. I mean, it might be supported, but you're not gonna be able to take advantage of all the features. So as Mike said, it, it really is in your best interest to go out there and check these compatibility matrices. And last, I'd like to remind people that at and is a proud member of the large contributing OpenStack operators team. It's a working group where we're really trying to improve the OpenStack environment for everyone. An exciting thing with OpenStack is the Cinder team, they actually have some third-party certifications for the Cinder drivers. But what we've experienced and what you've heard from um, Mike and Tony on the stage is they're focused at the most basic level of Cinder certification because they set up a certification suite to just meet the most basic criteria, can you work and can you bring it up? They were not focused in their initial certification on can you deal with all the failover reliability scenarios that uh, large operators and I think even large enterprises are gonna be very interested in. So we're interested in working with others, either in the large LCLO or the Cinder working team or any other forums to help define what are some additional tests or maybe even additional certification level that would be appropriate that really, really focus on building on the basics but validating that the reliability failover characteristics that AT&T and many others in this industry are really looking for when they're buying more expensive storage arrays. So once again, thank you very much for coming. We have a few minutes for any questions that uh, people may have. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, just a quick question, is there any chance you guys are gonna open source the, um, the web reporting tool around the heat stacks? I'm thinking in particular of the uh, FIO reporting. Um, I think you mentioned that you, you do some FIO tests and you report back to the UI the, the results of those tests. Um, I, I guess Rally can replace some of the other stuff, but I don't think Rally does any sort of in-depth FIO stuff like that. Yeah, we know um, it's something we just came up with uh, kind of early, or earlier this year, uh, so we, we're still kind of buttoning up all the, the little fixes still in that tool uh, and, and going through some testing, but we have talked about that and it's something we'll probably end up doing here in the near future. Um, you know, we did look at Tempest and, and Rally, but I don't know if, they're great for stressing, I think, a full cloud infrastructure, but we're really focused on testing, a, you know, a particular, uh, a single server and, and really stressing that particular server with how many volume. So that's kind of why that, that tool kind of came out and, and helped us out quite a bit there. Okay, so when you say single server, do you mean you've, you've kind of deployed an all-in-one stack on that server? The, no, so we still have a, you know, we have an entire uh, OpenStack infrastructure, you know, with multiple controllers, you know, Cinder running and Horizon, Keystone, but we, our, our main goal is to test that singular piece of hardware with, as a compute node. As a compute. Uh, so that's why that tool kind of helped out and, and uh, really we can just uh, focus into that, that particular. Okay. So when you're doing your, your timings of instance launch, you're basically using an aggregate or something else to isolate uh, 
launching onto that single compute node? Yeah, well, well th that actually gets defined via our heat template. So when, when we spin that up, we're making sure that we're picking that uh, particular compute host that we want to have via the heat okay. template. I see. So that heat template just gets pulled from our Git repository. The parameters from the web app get injected into that. And then, the, uh, like I said, the instances get spun up and the packages get pulled down to the instances. So this gives us the ability to also test our various images that we have within OpenStack. So we can you know, test in Ubuntu or CentOS or uh, Red Hat as well. So we don't have to install an agent or anything. It just does it all with that REST API. OK, so that clarifies things. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for coming. And we'll be available if you have any questions you want to ask afterwards. Thank you.